But first, an Oregon romance book writer who once wrote an essay titled, get this, How to Murder Your Husband, is on trial for murdering her husband. That and more coming up. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. My honor to be with you. Good Monday afternoon. Right now, we want to start with the trial where the defense is continuing to deliver their opening statement. This, of course, is in the trial against Nancy Brophy and the state of Oregon accused of murdering her husband. Day one, let's take you back into court. Had to give her commission back. This had been a huge headache for the brokers over time. They had money, they'd spent the money, and then all of a sudden they had to scrape money together to repay a commission because someone had abandoned their policy. It wasn't true of Medicare. Medicare allowed for an income stream that would not just come from, from the first time, but would carry you through. With life insurance, people buy one policy, maybe one policy in their lifetime. But with Medicare, and for those of you who are younger, you might not recognize this, Medicare can be tricky. And it's really nice to have a Medicare broker who will keep tabs on you, who will figure out what your prescriptions are, and who each year will help you kind of get the right policy to meet your needs. And if you're that person, your client probably only sees you once a year, but there's a good chance that you are going to have that client from the first day they become your client until later on when they pass and they no longer need Medicare. So in 2015, Nancy sold about 11 Medicare policies. In 2016, she sold about 44 new Medicare policies, but she re-enrolled the 11 clients she'd taken the year prior. In 2017, she sold about 120 new Medicare policies. Now, all of these clients rolled together were clients that she expected to keep year after year after year. She expected that if she could make this, build up her book of clients over this next few years, that she and Dan, so long as she just made a telephone call or checked in with somebody or just took the time to make sure she knew what their medications were, she expected that each one of these clients would be paying commissions long into her and uh, Dan's later ages. And she, she assumed that they would have a nice little steady income stream to carry them into retirement. Now, Dan Brophy was enthusiastic about Ms. Brophy's new line of work. On the mornings that his wife left to work the Medicare kiosk, he would pack her a lunch. And then invariably, he would send her a sweet little encouraging message as she hit the kiosk. For example, happy, happy kiosk days are here again. Nancy, hey, I sold a policy just sitting here. Dan, good work, keep up the job. There are about three years worth of text messages between Dan Brophy and Nancy Brophy that the police took off of Dan Brophy's phone. Throughout these messages, you will see Dan offering encouragement to Nancy, not just with respect to her Medicare policies, but in every other aspect of her life. He also expressed encouragement with respect to the specific retirement plan that the two of them had agreed to. Now, a Medicare career has a downside. It's a temporary downside, but it's definitely a downside. When you sell Medicare, there's a substantial delay between when you make a sale of the policy and when your commissions actually hit your bank account. Nancy Brophy could sell to her heart's content in one year, but the Brophys would not get paid any of her earned commissions until the following year. Dan and Nancy both knew that this commission payment structure was going to create a short-term cash flow crunch in the summer and fall. But they made adjustments and they planned adjustments to make this work. And they both knew it was going to get a lot easier if Nancy had the time to build up this book of Medicare clients and they no longer had a substantial mortgage. So in the summer of fall of 2017, Nancy Brophy did work her tail off at Medicare kiosk. She traveled all over the, over the place to develop a client base. One day she was in a Walgreen, Walgreens in uh, McMinnville. Another day she was at a Fred Meyer in Oregon City. 
And on the days that she wasn't sitting in a kiosk, she was at the United Healthcare office doing phone blitzes. After phone blitzes, she traveled to clients' homes. She went to the coast, she went to Hood River, she went to Vernonia, she went to Estacada. She went everywhere. It is this period of time in the summer and fall of 2017 that the state focuses on when it tells you that the Brophies were desperate, that the Brophies were broke, that the Brophies were feeling a financial catastrophe that caused Nancy Brophy to murder her husband. It is true. In August of 2017, money was very tight for the Brophies. But again, Dan and Nancy came up with a plan that offset the delay in the commission payments. As for the third part of the plan, Dan Brophy did keep teaching at OCI. But in the fall of 2017, he decided that he would teach weekend classes in 2018, rather than teaching Monday through Friday. When a longtime friend named Tanya Medlin offered Dan a part-time job at Avamir Rehabilitation Center, actually cooking for people, Dan Brophy jumped on it. He and Nancy agreed that they could use the extra money that he made to pay down their credit card debt and to pay off the second mortgage. And it's true that between November of 2017 and June of 2018, when Dan died, they had significantly reduced their credit card debt and they had significantly paid down the second mortgage. So why did Dan Brophy take a second job, part-time work at Avamir? Well, Dan Brophy was on board with the retirement plan that the two of them had worked out, mapped out together. The fourth part of the Brophy transition plan, and this is important, was a plan to subdivide their large lot and sell all or part of it off. The Brophy's goal was to have no mortgage in retirement. This is a, this is a Google view of the Brophy's property. And this was taken after Dan's death, so you're not really going to see what the property looked like uh, uh, as Nan, Nancy and Dan uh, entered into this transition plan. But on the lower part of this, you will see a little blue house and tiny kind of little letters that say 3380. There's a garage with a little white car, or maybe a truck, and a little gray car in the driveway. That would be the Brophy's property. And it runs from Southwest 108th Avenue all the way back to where you see those little white structures at the back of the property. Right next to the Brophy property, if you look at the top of the screen, is a lot that was identical in size and shape to the Brophy's. The owner of that property, uh, initially he just had his house by himself, but as he faced retirement, he had that lot broken into three taxable lots. He made a significant profit by doing that. He was able to actually stay in his own home, but he had made an excellent financial decision and the Brophy's paid attention to that. So, in June of 2017, Nancy and Dan Brophy both talked with a friend of theirs named Richard Freimark. Mr. Freimark is a commercial realtor. He doesn't really do residential work. But they asked him what it would take to subdivide their property, just like their neighbor. Mr. Freimark gave them the name of an engineering firm that could help the Brophy create these three taxable lots. He did, however, urge them to get the backyard cleaned up before the property was evalu evaluated for sale. Now there was a residential realtor who lived down the street from the Brophy's. He came by to look at the property and he estimated that if they were able to subdivide this triple lot, that they could, uh, re it could result in a sale of $700,000 or maybe even more. But the residential realtor, a man named Paul Johnston, also warned the Brophy's that if they wanted to make that kind of a profit, they were going to need to clean up the back of their lot. During this time, Richard Freimark ran a title report on the Brophy's property. He was alarmed to see that even though Nancy Brophy had been on the deed when they first bought the house, when Nancy and Dan had refinanced sometime in the mid-2000s, 
he had some, somehow fallen off of the deed. So Mr. Freimark sent them the paperwork to correct the problem. The evidence will show that um, Nancy, let's see if I can get this to work. <laughs> And it, evidence will show that after she, she received this uh, paperwork that Nancy talked to Dan about it. Dan, how's the day treating you, Nancy? Okay, I left some papers on the table dining room. Take them to the bank and get them notarized. They put my name on the deed, which Richard says will make the future paperwork easier. Dan, will we go to the bank together? Nancy, you don't need me. Dan, allegedly. I would prefer accompaniment. <laughs> Why did, did Dan Brophy agree to go put Nancy Brophy on the lease in 2017? Well, he did it because he knew that she was a part owner of the property, but he also did it because he was trying to pave the way so that when they sold their home later on, things would go more smoothly. In other words, Dan Brophy was in on the plan. Now, we talked about this lot and how it didn't look anything like the overhead that you'd seen. Dan Brophy was a gardener. He loved gardening. He treated this huge, this back lot is probably like a, I think the whole lot is about a half acre. So the back lot is probably um, two thirds of that. Dan treated this large backyard like a little mini farm. He'd grown up in the country and he, he loved having what he called his life science experiments in his backyard. Now, Nancy Brophy loved the, that about him. She loved that he smelled like the earth. But she would have drawn the line at Dan's chickens. And the chickens became a running joke in their marriage. Dan Brophy knew, though, that, that somewhere along the line, that property had gotten completely out of control for him. He even texted friends between 2017 and 2018, describing how overwhelming the project was. Several witnesses will testify that cleaning up this back lot was a massive, massive project. The backyard was covered in blackberry bushes that were 12 to 16 feet high. Dan had buried these big steel barrels and commercial sinks for his various science projects. Cleaning up the backyard was not something that Dan and Nancy were going to be able to do alone. They could play a part, but they both knew that they were going to need professional help and it was going to be expensive. The evidence will demonstrate that Dan Brophy was fully in agreement with paying the money to get this back lot cleaned up so that they could subdivide and sale. In September of 2017, in the midst of this low cash flow period that he and his wife had anticipated, Dan Brophy took a $35,000 loan against his retirement. Now, Dan Brophy had done this in the past. There was a time when they needed a new roof and they had borrowed against the retirement. Dan had paid it all back as required. And they had agreed that this might be a good time to take that loan again. The purpose wasn't just to bring the mortgage due. If, he had, if during this cash flow crunch, all he'd wanted to do was bring the mortgage current, he would have taken much less out. The goal was both to bring the mortgage current, but also to fix up the house, because Dan knew it was going to be expensive to get the property ready to sell. Dan asked that they um, kind of wait until the harvest was behind him in 2017 before they actually brought the landscapers in. But in November of 2017, Nancy Brophy began to look for landscapers who were willing to do the work. Nancy. Getting the first bid on the yard today, Dan. Cool, are you home already? Nancy, no, he's looking by himself. Dan, okay, I'll be home in about a half an hour. Nancy, he may be gone. I found the name because it's advertised that he can deal with the blackberry bushes. She did get a few bids, but the truth is in November of 2017, most of the people who came to look at the property were absolutely unwilling to even make a bid or take on the challenge. Dan's unique garden was such a huge challenge that they didn't know if they had the equipment to handle it. Dan, with his father's help, had buried scores of tubs, wine barrels, utility sinks, all to keep his plants contained. Because they were buried and not sitting on the top of the, the ground, 
The removal process required heavier equipment than many landscapers had. When they finally hired the dynamic duo of James Denny and Tamara Alva, Dan affectionately called them the Yard Warriors. The wa Yard Warriors will testify in this trial. They will testify that both Dan. We are going to take a break. Don't worry, you're not going to miss any of the opening statement by the defense attorney in this case. Did Nancy Brophy murder her husband? Stay tuned. We're going to bring you more on the other side. Let's get you back to the state of Oregon for the romance novelist murder trial. Why do we call it that? Well, because the defendant is a now 71-year-old romance novelist who wrote a book about how to murder your husband. She's now charged with murdering her husband. You haven't missed any of the opening statement by the defense. Let's take you back into the courtroom. So, and that Dan was very much a part of the plan. James Denny will testify that he and Dan worked closely to sift through Dan's many possessions in the backyard and decide what would go and what would stay. Dan was in complete control of that process. He had the final say. And Dan was never irritated or grumpy with James Denny. In fact, James Denny got the sense that the unburdening in many ways felt good to Dan Brophy. You'll hear that Dan Brophy was a collector. And over the course of their marriage, their long, long marriage, Nancy tolerated Dan's habit of collecting. She never seemed, at least to James Denny, to be all that annoyed that Dan had so much stuff. And she expressed kind of an understanding that as long as it took to collect all that stuff, it was going to take a little while to uncollect it. She was willing to go slowly and to let Dan and Mr. Denny sort out the pacing as Dan was really w willing to let go of things. They were working together again to tackle this joint project because it was a project that was easier together than apart. The Yard Warriors started their work cleaning up this backyard in December of 2017. But by May, when the Brophies in initially planned to subdivide the lot and then market the house, the Yard Warriors weren't even close to having the yard ready to be subdivided and placed on the market. But Dan and Nancy then decided, well, if we can't make the summer sales season, we will shoot for the fall of 2018. So with the sale of the house on hold until the fall, Dan took the parts that the Yard Warriors had already cleared, cleared out and again built himself little gardens uh, in the area that was available, but the understanding was that the Yard Warriors would continue on in their efforts, still with the goal of having everything done by the fall. Dan and Nancy had, had for many, many years, a very incredible um, travel life. I think they'd been to three different continents, 30 different, I don't know if it's 30 countries, I might have my numbers wrong, but they'd been to many, many different countries, They'd been all over the world. They'd been to Hong Kong. Um, they had visited Dan's parents in Thailand. They'd gone a, a bunch of different places, and it was a huge part of the life that they enjoyed together. They really enjoyed travel. As Nancy was approaching retirement, four years older than Dan, she was starting to think about travel and how much, that, how much fun that would be. As happens with any couple, the Brophys did have to negotiate some changes in their plan here and there. Never the 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 core of the plan. For example, there was a time that Nancy got really excited about moving to Portugal. She imagined that she and Dan could have a house for not very much money, live on their social security in Portugal, and then they could use that as a place that they could then travel all around Europe. Dan thought that traveling in Europe would be interesting, but he wasn't particularly interested in being an expat. He wasn't sure he'd have enough to do, and he thought that Portugal might be too hot. Well, they talked about it. And you know, they both knew that they would miss Dan's family terribly. So they compromised. They decided that they would stay in Portland indefinitely, and they would simply build more travel into their life. So beginning in 2017, they began to travel more frequently. In 2017, Dan Brophy actually joined his wife on a cruise filled with romance writers. I don't know how many guys were there besides Dan, 
but they enjoyed themselves. In the summer of 2017, the Brophys celebrated they, their June birthdays with a week at the beach. Dan and Nancy both had June birthdays, so each year the celebration of birthdays happened together, and typically they would get away. In January of 2018, Dan and Nancy spent a week at a romantic bed and breakfast in British Columbia. In March of 2018, they took another romantic trip to Monterey and took a couple of cooking classes. And at the time Dan Brophy died, Nancy and Dan were planning a summer trip to Mount Rushmore, a trip that Dan had always, always wanted to make. One of the lovely things about the Brophy marriage was that while they had many, many interests that overlapped, they loved cooking, they loved travel, they loved each other's sense of humor, but they also had interests that were their very own. Dan Brophy loved mushroom hunting, he loved his chickens, and he loved living life as a science project. Nancy Brophy loved writing. You will hear from several of Ms. Brophy's writer friends. You will learn that research especially hands-on research, is a big part of many writers' lives. To support her writing, Ms. Brophy has spent good money on night vision goggles, a telescope, law enforcement quality handcuffs, high-powered binoculars, art supplies, antique glass doorknobs, and lots and lots of locks. Ms. Brophy's not alone. Other writers splurge too. You'll hear from at least two writers. One bought a giant crossbow that is as tall as I am to support her writing. Another writer, Delilah, writes Victorian romance. For years, Delilah searched for a chastity belt that she could afford. And Delilah will assure you that it was not to use with her husband. Instead, she wanted to know how the hinges felt she wanted to know what it sounded like when the key was inserted. She wanted to feel how heavy it was. Ms. Brophy's writer friends will also describe Ms. Brophy's immersive writing process, which they have witnessed firsthand. Several writers will tell you that they have been at writing uh, retreats with Ms. Brophy and that her, her practice is to literally place herself in a corner She'll stare at the ceiling or stare at a wall, and no one hears from her for a couple of hours. When she's finally jolted back into the group presence, she typically can come out with a story that includes characters, scenes, chapters. Her writer friends were amazed that she could literally create an entire novel sometimes in her brain as she stared into space without once putting her pen to paper. Other writers will talk about Nancy's creative process more generally. They will tell you that one of the things Nancy really liked was these drives, these long drives that she had to, had to take as part of her Medicare career. She loved driving because that was when her brain was the most creative. She could drive out to McMinnville and have several new ideas for her writing by the time that she got there. Let's shift again. Firearms. To understand what happened in this case, you need to take yourself back to 2017 in the United States of America. That was a year that our entire country was talking about guns. And Nancy Brophy was certainly a part of that conversation. Listening carefully to the bellicose tone of our country's discourse, Nancy started to have a shift in her thinking. Nancy Brophy did not grow up with guns. Her family does not like guns. She came from a family of lawyers, and she'd spent her college years advocating for very progressive causes. Guns were not her thing. Even when she was married to a police officer in the 70s, she showed no interest in guns. But she had friends who had guns, and they were law-abiding. And at a family gathering in November of 2017, Ms. Brophy realized that all of Dan Brophy's had fa family had guns. Dan's brother had a gun. Dan's dad had a gun. Dan's son, Nathaniel, owned several firearms. In fact, Nathaniel had even built an AR-15 on his own from a gun kit. To her great surprise, she learned that Dan Brophy's mother 
on the stun gun, 2017 was a year also of numerous mass shootings, especially school shootings. And Nancy Brophy paid close attention to that news. On November 16th of 2017, a nutty guy named Kevin Neal shot his wife and four of her friends with a homemade gun. Then Mr. Neal tried unsuccessfully to enter a, an elementary school to randomly shoot at children. The crime occurred in California, but it quickly became national news. Mr. Neal could not lawfully purchase a firearm because he had a restraining order out on him, but he found a way around that by building himself his own gun from parts. The New York Times and several other major news outlets covered this story, noting that gun kits were legal and that some states had begun to consider limitations on their sale. Now again, in 2017, uh, the ATF and federal authorities made it clear that they had no interest in regulating gun kits themselves or gun building by individuals. Well, unfortunately, we're having a few technical issues. They are in the courtroom, but we will take a break. When we come back, certainly we'll take you back to the courtroom. Do you think that this defense opening statement reads like a romance novel? Tell us what you think. We'll be right back on the other side. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ashley Wilcott. We want to take you back into the courtroom in Oregon where Nancy Crampton Brophy's attorney is delivering an opening statement that really does sound as detailed as a book that you might read, similar to a romance novel written by the defendant. Let's go back into court. You haven't missed any of the opening statements. Nancy started to think about writing a book that flipped the script on a guy like that. The story she had in her mind was about a woman in an abusive relationship. In the story, the woman is afraid to leave her partner, but she's also afraid that she's going to get killed if she stays. The woman cannot legally buy a gun because she'd been hospitalized for depression as a young woman. A related New York Times article Ms. Brophy read at the time included links to the online gun sites that had been cited in the article. So in late November of 2017, Ms. Brophy used those links, including one to a place called ghostgunner.net, uh, to see what was there. Ms. Brophy was fascinated with her storyline, and she went back to those sites several times over the next few weeks. So as to better describe her protagonist's experience, Ms. Brophy considered whether she should buy a gun kit and put it together as she wrote the book. On Christmas Eve, after a couple of glasses of wine, Ms. Brophy splurged and she bought herself a gun kit from one of those two sites in the New York Times article, ghostguns.com. She thought of the purchase as kind of a jigsaw puzzle where she could put a gun together from pieces. That week after New Year's, Dan and Nancy Brophy went to Sook Harbor, British Columbia, for a romantic getaway. Dan put a hold on their mail. When they returned to Portland, Dan went to the post office to pick up the mail. He brought the gun kit home. Ms. Brophy was excited to open it, but soon realized that putting a gun kit together was not as she had imagined. She asked Dan, do we have a drill press? Dan laughed and assured her that they did not. The gun kit kind of was stowed into the closet, but Nancy Brophy continued to work on this story. As she continued to develop this storyline, she realized that she could not machine a gun kit, the, certainly not the one she'd purchased, but she wondered whether a better puzzle would be to analyze the actual gun parts. During this time period, Nancy Brophy talked to several of her writer friends about this story. She told some of them that she had bought a gun kit to build the gun from parts as she wrote the story. Her more knowledgeable friends laughed and told her that buying a gun kit was a stupid idea. She agreed, 
acknowledging that she had learned that lesson too late. As she continued to develop the storyline, Ms. Brophy wondered whether a better puzzle would be to analyze the actual gun parts. She continued to research guns and gun parts, but much of the research that she did coincided with her an anticipation of writer events. The other truth is, the more she read about guns, the more that she wondered whether she and Dan shouldn't own a gun. Nancy mentioned to a friend that she wished Dan would take a gun with him when he went mushroom hunting. Dan hunted mushrooms alone, deep in the woods, and he'd often told her that mushroom hunting could be pretty dangerous because people were so territorial about their mushroom spots. Dan didn't take the risk as seriously as Nancy Brophy did, but she worried anyway. On January 31st, Ms. Brophy met with a writer friend during the day, and she talked about her story. That evening, she went back to the same sites and again researched gun kits. The next morning on February 1st, Ms. Brophy woke up to a follow-up news story about the Las Vegas mass shooter. You might remember he was the guy who leaned out of a casino window and shot all the people who were attending a concert down below. This was a follow-up story, but it's one that she'd been following for some time. After reading that story that night, Ms. Brophy researched gun stores in Oregon. On February 14th, there was a mass shooting in Florida. This is the shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. The next day, Nancy Brophy researched, how much does a Glock 17 cost, gun safety classes, and the Portland Expo gun show. Nancy Brophy lobbied Dan Brophy again. This time, her husband acquiesced and agreed she should go buy a gun. The next day, Ms. Brophy withdrew $400 from her checking account. Now, she knew from her research that a gun was likely to cost over $600, but Dan Brophy had agreed to split the cost. On February 17th, Ms. Brophy went to the gun show. She presented her legal identification and bought a fully legal, fully registered handgun. When she brought the gun home, Dan looked it over. He wasn't really sure they were gun people. Dan wasn't excited about carrying the gun. In fact, he told Ms. Brophy that he had absolutely no interest in packing heat when he went mushroom hunting. Truth is, Nancy never carried the gun either. In fact, when the Oregon State criminalist later examined that gun, he said it was in like new condition. The cleaning brush appears to have never been used. The manual and the cleaning kit were still sealed. Dan Brophy thought maybe they should sell the gun. Nancy Brophy thought about taking the gun apart, but she agreed with Dan that it would probably be better to keep it like new. They both thought they might be able to sell it somewhere down the road someday. Nancy had actually done some research and realized that those private sales uh, were more complicated in the state of Oregon. We will prove that when, oh, let me take you back a minute. About two days after uh, she brought this gun home and they decided that Dan really wasn't gonna carry it and had some real doubts about whether they were gun people, Nancy Brophy went back to these sites that she'd been visiting. And again, these sites are typically the ghost gun type sites. And she's already purchased a, a ghost gun, but she went back to the sites and this time, a pop-up or some kind of a, an ad for a slide uh, came onto her screen, and she went ahead and bought it. She assumed that it might be easier to take a slide apart and probably more cost-effective than to try to take this gun apart that she and Dan were trying to keep in new condition. We'll prove that when that slide was delivered to the Brophy home, it was Dan Brophy who took delivery. Nancy Brophy was in McMinnville selling Medicare. Later, Ms. Brophy watched a YouTube showing how to disassemble the slide. Let's shift our focus again to the week before Dan Brophy died. 
Nancy Brophy has always had several stories living in her head, but she also had several partially or completely written books. She had been sending pitches to publishers for years. And on May 25th, a really exciting email popped into her inbox. A publisher was interested in the first book of a trilogy she'd written called Witches, A Love Story. Over the next several days, Nancy Brophy was living constantly with her characters from this book the publisher was interested in. Her characters Phaedra and Celestial and Hope were ever present in her brain. The night before Dan died, Nancy Brophy didn't sleep well. She'd been up all night thinking about her characters and a problem with the plot in this story. When she was later interviewed by police, Nancy, having already determined that the person who had been shot was her husband, something she gleaned by just looking at the sad faces of the people staring out at her as she got near OCI. She told the police that Dan got up around 4 a.m. to feed the chickens and walk the dogs. This was his usual morning routine. She said that when he came upstairs to shower, she talked to him about a leak under the sink. She will tell you. And this is a defense attorney widely admired for her attention to detail, Lisa Maxfield. You're not going to miss any of her opening statement. When we come back, we're going to take you right back where we left off. Call now. Atlanta criminal defense attorney Josh Schiffer. Thank you, Josh. I know you've been watching along with me, and I just wanted to pull you in before we go right back to where we left off with that opening statement by the defense attorney. What do you think? Do you think the, the version of the opening that this was all research for her novel, buying a gun, things that she did were research, or do you think, like the state contends, instead those were steps planning for the murder of her husband? It's an extraordinarily convenient, uh, you know, juncture. Uh, she can certainly stand up without any question and say, this is what I do for a living. I do this research all the time. It's just like any lawyer. If you go look at the search records of litigators, especially in criminal law, prosecutor and defense, man, you're going to see some wild stuff. Whether the jury's going to buy that when there's all this insurance information, whether there's other motivations, I don't know. Highly circumstantial case. The social media is blowing up with this attorney's Miss Maxwell's demeanor and how this presentation's happening with a lot of polarizing feedback that she's lacking the emotion or that she's doing a great job being authoritative and really bringing the authenticity to uh, the explanation of what this trial's gonna have. So certainly gripping. And, and it's going to be a great story to watch. And is it gripping to the jury? That's what we don't know. I agree with your description of the social media responses. And I can tell you that we know this lawyer is very well respected. She's been practicing in Oregon for a very long time. She's known as a lawyer's lawyer, paying attention to detail, being very, very successful in court. So we'll look forward. Matt Johnson is there and he'll be reporting live from there throughout the course of this trial to give us also some of the of the courtroom. All right. Thank you, Josh. You're going to stay with us into the next hour. Let's go back into court now where you haven't missed any of the continuing opening statement by that defense attorney. She did what she would normally do on the morning she doesn't go to work. She left her nightshirt on. She added a pair of tights and some flip flops and she drove to the Starbucks drive through to get her copy. She will tell you that she was still fully, fully immersed in her story. And she drove, thinking about a detail and then stopping to briefly jot down her thought and then driving some more as she worked out the next detail. You'll hear evidence from two psychologists. They will explain to you what can happen to the human memory when a person suffers a traumatic shock. Learning that one's husband has been murdered is perhaps one of the most extreme shocks that any one of us can imagine. It's the emotional equivalent of being hit by a freight train one didn't see coming. There is literally a chemical flood to the brain that disrupts the neurological coding and storage of memories. 
the disruption, the chemical disruption, will affect a person immediately, but it can also leave large memory holes for events that happened before, during, and after a traumatic event. One of the psychologists, Dr. Warford, is also an expert in domestic violence and the components of a healthy marriage. She's reviewed the discovery in this case, including the police interviews and the last three years of text messages between Dan and Nancy Brophy. Dr. Warford has also interviewed and conducted a battery of psychological tests on Ms. Brophy. Dr. Warford's professional opinion will support a core defense fact. Nancy Brophy and Dan Brophy had an unusually healthy and vibrant marriage right up until the very end. Nancy's marriage was so healthy that the younger people that they mentored wanted a marriage just like theirs. Nancy's Brophy, Nancy Brophy's niece, Susan Estrada, lived with the Brophys for, well, a few different times, but once for about a year. She told the police they had a great marriage. They had one of those rare few relationships that made me think, hey, marriage might not be a bad idea. Another witness admired Dan and Nancy's relationship so much that she said, I knew I wanted a brophy marriage for myself. A friend who was in their home weekly would say, I would have loved to have had a marriage like theirs. Nancy Brophy's very best friends, the women who have known her, some of them since college, but most of them for decades, will tell you that Nancy Brophy was crazy about Dan Brophy and that never changed. Just a sample of the testimony you'll hear at trial. Dan was perfect for Nancy and Nancy knew it. Nancy always talked sweetly about Dan. Whenever I was around Nancy, it was Dan this, Dan that. Nancy admired, admired and respected Dan. You could see that every time they were together. Nancy described Dan as the smartest man she knew. She was so proud of him. It was like they had been married for a hundred years. Each of them talked so positively about the other. They accepted each other. They supported each other. They obviously enjoyed each other's company. Nancy's very closest personal friends will tell you that in all of the time they have known Nancy Brophy, she has never, never badmouthed her husband. I've known Nancy for donkey years, and she has never had a harsh word for Dan. If Nancy complained about Dan, it was, quote, in the way a happy woman does. For example, she complained about Dan's noisy chickens, but she always gathered her leftovers from lunch to take home to them. She even bought Dan a chicken suit as part of their running joke. It cracked him up and he enjoyed dressing up. We've got to take a short break, but you will not miss a thing. We're going to take you right back into the courtroom for the finale of the defense opening statement. Josh Shiver will stay with us and our own court TV, Matt Johnson, who has been inside that courtroom, will join us with some behind the scenes insight. Stay here with Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Oh, today. Good Monday afternoon to you. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. Honored to be with you. This hour, we're covering a lot of different cases, but we want to get you right back into the courtroom. Oregon versus Nancy Crampton Brophy. The romance murder trial. She wrote a romance novel about how to kill a husband and is now accused of murdering her own husband. 71-year-old defendant at this time, 68 at the time of the alleged crime. The prosecution states... It was premeditated, she planned it, she killed her husband. Defense maintains, no, she was doing research for her novels and she did not kill her husband. We're gonna take you back live into court. I'm sorry, not live into court. We hit the pause button so you wouldn't miss a thing. We wanna take you back now for the defense attorney as she wraps up her opening statement. Nancy told her friends that things about Dan that end up driving you a little bit nuts are also the most enticing. That never changed. Nancy Brophy knew that she was very, very blessed to have the marriage that she did, and so she nurtured it. For years at writer conferences, Nancy Brophy talked to Dan every night. 
Her roommates at those conferences often heard her tell him, I love you. Anyone who claims that Nancy's relationship to Dan had changed is just wrong. Wrong. Even little things will demonstrate that truth. On May 4th, less than a month before Dan died, Nancy was at the Sylvia Beach Hotel for a writer's event. After dinner, she went upstairs to call her husband. She left him a sweet voice message that was still on his phone when he died. Hey, we made it. Uh, it's, this has turned out to be a really fun little group. And uh, we're staying the Hemingway room, the, uh, uh, the, the animals weren't as bad. First off, they're done with uh, either books or newsprint, and so they're kind of paper mache and they're really kind of... Right, we can't so I'm not that. as offended by that. Our window is open. We can get a breeze from the coast. Uh, but call me when you get this. Thanks. Bye-bye. Sorry, folks, I have no control over the volume, but um, in any event, she left this, Dan the same kind of message that she'd left him a thousand times. Later, he called her, and they did have a chance to chat more. The fact is, though, literally a month before Dan died, Dan and Nancy Brophy were doing the lovely, kind things that they'd always done for each other. They were staying in touch with each other. They were telling each other about their days. In fact, while Nancy was at the Sylvia Beach Hotel, one of the things that she said to her friends after they had gone to a little hole-in-the-wall restaurant somewhere at the beach, was that she could not wait to tell Dan Brophy about this restaurant. It was the kind of place that he would love. And she was excited as they scooted back to the hotel to share this new discovery with her husband. The states, say that, states suggest that Nancy Brophy's life was going to get a lot better when Dan was gone. They're wrong. Nancy was lost after Dan was killed. Her friends will tell you that she sounded very confused. It was, a, it was as though the earth had fallen away from her feet. Nancy was overwhelmed. A friend says Nancy was very un-Nancy. After Dan died, she appeared totally blank. She was in shock. We saw her cry, and I've only seen her tear up one other time. She's a southern-raised woman, and that stiff upper lip is paramount. To see her cry was extremely rare. She apologized to us for crying. She was embarrassed, but she was grief-stricken. She was in total shock. Dan's sudden death also upended the Brophy's plan to legally subdivide this lot for a larger profit. While they had managed to get Nancy on the deed, Dan was the only one on the mortgage. And since Nancy was almost 68 years old, it was very unlikely that Wells Fargo would agree to add her to the mortgage. After Dan died, Ms. Brophy talked with Richard Freimark again. He told her about a likely problem. If the bank learned that its sole note holder had died, it was likely to call the entire note due. This fact had Nancy Brophy scrambling to get the house cleaned up and sold before Wells Fargo got wind of Dan Brophy's death. The bank would be treated fairly, but so would she. Subdividing the lot was now just too lengthy of a process to complete. She simply needed to get that backyard cleaned up as best she could, sell the, ho or sell the house as quickly as possible, and pay off the note. She also really wasn't ready for Dan's death because the loop will was lost. The friends who were with her in the time after this will tell you that there was huge chaos and panic over the fact that Nancy Brophy could not find the wills that she and Dan had uh, uh, put together several years before. Finally, maybe a month, even longer, after Dan's death, Jack Brophy came to the house with some friends from the church. They were trying to clean out a garage that had been filled to the gills with some of Dan's collectibles. And in the, in the very back of the box, in, in back of the garage in a box, Jack Brophy found the will. Nancy Brophy was so relieved. The other thing that was lost that summer was that Medicare enrollment season that was going to come in 2018. That was the year that Nancy thought that she could maybe sell another 200 policies and build the book that would carry everything forward. She just didn't have the energy. She was overwhelmed, she was sad, and she was in no condition to sell Medicare. 
Murder can be a huge complication when it comes to life insurance. At the very, very best, a murder will serious de seriously delay the payment of insurance proceeds. I tell you this because the state suggests that what, what caused this murder was this intense, acute financial ruin uh, that was raining down on the Brophys at the time of Dan's death. I think the evidence will show, and certainly our forensic accountant will suggest to you, that by June of 2018, that simply wasn't true. By June of 2018, the Brophys were in pretty good financial shape. And as of June 2nd, they probably, between both of their accounts, could have put their hands on $10,000 cash if they needed to. But as I said, murder can be a complicating process. Ms. Brophy, especially as she talked to different uh, insurance companies, told her friends it would probably be years before these claims were resolved. The state makes much about a call that Ms. Brophy made on June 6th, I believe. What you'll learn during trial is that after she had talked with the police, the police urged her to talk to someone who was what they called a tips counselor. The tips counselor gave Ms. Brophy a book, and at the back of the book was a little checklist about what to do in a time like this. One of the things on the checklist, in addition to finding a will, was to try to figure out exactly which insurance policies you had and to begin the process. And as I say, it was never going to be too soon to begin the process, because when someone's murdered, what we know is that the process can take a long, long time. Dan's sudden death created other problems with the life insurance, too. Do you remember that very expensive return of premium policy that Dan bought, betting Dan that would live to be age 78, the one she paid three times or six times the premium for? Well, that lost a huge part of its value because Dan Brophy died too young. Remember the $250,000 policy she bought in November of 2016? Well, that was still within the contestability period. In the Dearest Dan letter, Nancy Brophy talks about a guy named Schneider. I've already always forgotten his name, but she says, you know, when I saw him, I worried about you. Well, what had happened with Mr. Schneider is that he had purchased a life insurance policy on his life and his wife's life. And then Ms. Brophy, shortly before she wrote the Dearest Dan letter to her husband, Mr. Schneider had called and explained that his wife had died within the two-year contestability period and that he was having a heck of a time uh, in his fight with the insurance company to get them to pay the claim. If Dan Brophy had died on November 6th of 2018, just five months after the day he did die, this would have been a much easier insurance claim to make. While Dan Brophy was alive, Nancy Brophy had a great listener, a wonderful lover, a consummate chef, and an entertaining travel partner. Most of all, she had an all-around best friend. She shared her life with a man who never failed to make her laugh. Nancy Brophy was blessed with a true partner who always looked out for her and always looked forward to a future with her, as she did him. After you've heard all the evidence in this case, we are certain that you will understand that Nancy Brophy did not kill her husband. Thank you.